Defense News is proudly sponsored by Navy Federal Credit Union. If you're a member of our nation's armed forces, the Department of Defense, or if your family is, we'd be proud to serve you too. On this episode of Defense News Weekly, the annual Service Members of the Year Awards honor men and women from around the military. We've got highlights from the event. Plus, the Navy develops a new Ironman deep water dive suit. Learn about what it offers and why the Sea Service is pursuing it. Also, need to deliver 1,000 volts to a suspect on your base? We test out a new non-lethal force protection tool, the Taser 10. We've got those stories and more lined up for you this week, so don't go away. It's the latest in news and analysis from the Pentagon to the platoon, here on Defense News Weekly. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly, I'm Andrea Scott. The annual Service Members of the Year Awards are a celebration of some of the most courageous and compassionate men and women in the military. Honoring members of each of the branches, the gala featured speakers from around the government and Pentagon and highlighted extraordinary acts of service. Held at the Reagan Building in the nation's capital, this year featured a range of compelling stories about the winners from each branch, recounting acts of heroism and selflessness. Here are some highlights from the event. Good evening, everyone. It's so great to see everybody back this year. It's an honor to be back here with all of you. Good evening, everybody. It's great to see so many familiar faces. Senator Scott, uh, Senator Ernst over here, and so many others who've joined us tonight. Kira and I are very proud to be here with our friends at the Military Times Foundation celebrating the incredible achievements of our women and men in uniform. What stood out to me was just their unwavering commitment to their mission, whether it was Afghan evacuation flights, deterring Russian aggression, rescuing innocent civilians in the dark of night 50 miles from the coast, or just you know the ingenuity in addressing new challenges presented on the battlefield. I mean, these are America's future leaders, and we should all be proud of their hard work and tenacity that keeps us all safe at night. What we do in the Coast Guard directly impacts homeland security. And I know that each job that I've had, every watch I've stood, you know, ships I've driven, that what we're doing is protecting our nation. And there is a deep sense of, of patriotism and, and pride in that. My name is Chelsea Sheehy. I'm a lieutenant in the U.S. Coast Guard, and I'm the commanding officer of Coast Guard Cutter Charles Sexton. Back in the spring of 2022, we responded to a vessel that was unseaworthy, and it appeared to be a migrant vessel at sea. We noticed that the vessel was actually capsized and that they were holding onto it, sitting on top of the vessel that was capsized and sinking. They were waving their arms. They were in distress. They were visibly concerned and worried. They didn't have any food. They didn't have any water. They didn't have any flotation devices or safety equipment. And once we got alongside and we started taking them off the capsized vessel, there was moments of relief. And we rescued upwards of 15 people. And if we didn't see them waving their arms, if, if we weren't there, then within 24, 48 hours, a more dire situation would have resulted. I am very overwhelmed to be the recipient of this very meaningful award. My selection was made possible because a collection of people thought I deserved it. And so that's what makes me the most emotional. It's reflecting on the dedicated time and effort put in by various people to include my brother and sister-in-law, who, who I've looked up to for well over a decade, one of my last bosses and now a mentor, my very own crew, which this video clip really pulls on my heartstrings as I've recently departed the Charles Sexton, and a retired commander who I had not met until tonight, all believed I deserved this award, 
for different reasons because our paths cross for different reasons. And so I'm so very grateful for all those who pulled their resources all to recognize me. Captain Garcia's journey is a testament to the American dream. As a Mexican immigrant, she enlisted in the Air Force in 2003, finally receiving her commission in 2015, and then ultimately transitioning to the United States Space Force as it was established. Amid Russia's assault on Ukraine, Captain Garcia led a deployment of an electronic electromagnetic warfare squadron to a remote European location. She showed amazing bravery and ingenuity in leading the first ever deployment of this brand new capability to the European AOR and the, during the continent's most uh, uh, significant crisis in decades. Space Force defends against the threat to the space domain is very contested and we protect and defend against the ability to maneuver that domain. This recognition is a testament to the remarkable men and women who served alongside me and I am merely just a representative of their hard work. To the members of the 4th Expeditionary Electromagnetic Warfare Flight Delta, those 54 men and women, airmen and guardians who stood up that operation deserve all the credit. But I stand here representing them. To my fellow service members and fellow award recipients, I count myself so incredibly blessed to stand next to you. And to my mother, I love you so much. Thank you for your sacrifice and bringing us over to this amazing country. And again, our service is payment to this amazing country. And last but not least. <laughs> to my husband, Chris, he's a retired Marine and he's my biggest critic and my biggest supporter and gives me that tough Marine mentoring when I need it and even when I don't. So thank you, I love you. Thank you so much. The leadership and selfless service illustrated here tonight is truly inspiring for John and me, and it makes us so proud to be here as well and just bear witness uh, to your recognition as courageous and strong Americans. So we thank you just as journalists uh, and Americans uh, from the bottom of our heart. We would like to ask that all of this year's service members of the year recipients please stand to be recognized once more. Next up, the Navy is developing a new deep water dive suit called the Deep Water Expeditionary with No Decompression or Descent Suit. It's meant to increase a sailor's range of motion and improve other functions from the previous model. For a report on the suit, we turn to Navy Times' Diana Stancy. The Navy is testing out a new Iron Man diving suit that aims to enhance diver safety allowing them to work longer and in deeper waters. The deep sea expeditionary with no decompression, known as the Descend system, is a form-fitting atmospheric dive suit composed of rotating and flexible joints to provide divers with greater flexibility while also keeping internal pressure steady. The Navy is wanting to improve safety and efficiency for projects such as deep ocean salvage of vessels and aircraft, underwater rescues, explosive ordnance disposal, and ship hull maintenance. That's why it started developing this suit roughly five years ago. In working deep underwater, one of the key challenges divers face is dealing with pressure in deep waters and decompression sickness, which happens when nitrogen doesn't have enough time to clear from a diver's blood due to a rapid decrease in water pressure, a potentially life-threatening condition also known as the bends. To avoid that, currently divers must use a saturation system or diving bell pressurized with gas to match the outside water pressure. The deeper they descend, the greater the danger from increasing water pressure. They then gradually ascend, stopping at intervals to prevent nitrogen from forming bubbles in their blood or tissue resulting in decompression sickness. But this new suit eliminates the need for a gradual ascent to the surface because it provides one consistent atmospheric pressure. This allows divers to spend greater time underwater by eliminating the need for the slow ascent. A job that would take mixed gas divers two to three weeks to complete 
could potentially be knocked out in a day or two in the new suit and eliminate the risk of decompression sickness, according to Paul McMurtry, Naval Sea Systems Command Diving Systems Program Manager. The suit is still in the early stages though, and so it won't hit the fleet for several more years. Next steps include becoming designated as a future naval capability sometime from fiscal 2025 to 2027, followed by a three-year development program to craft a prototype suit capable of diving 300 feet. If successful, the suit would then need certification prior to the production of multiple suits. When we return, we fire a new taser meant for base security and find out why you might see more at Marine Corps bases. Welcome back to Defense News Weekly. You might best know Axon by its taser devices that police have been carrying for years. Did you know the company has body cameras and even drones? Axon showed its offerings at Modern Day Marine, where we caught up with its federal lead to find out what the company has to offer military bases. Yeah, so at Axon, we are very proud of the ecosystem of services and technology we can bring to a customer like the Marine Corps. As we think about Force Design 2030, uh, it's about evolve, involving and incorporating technology into the, uh, the environment that is the Marine Corps. So you think about something like base security, we're able to offer uh, solutions like the Taser solution for law enforcement personnel. We're able to offer things like situational awareness through drones or UAS services uh, that could help with security around the edge of the base. We can offer uh, integrated fleet services that can help with gate uh, security, et cetera. And all of those things can come together into a unified platform, uh, which is our evidence.com service, which compiles all of that information into a singular place for the Marine Corps to be able to understand what's happening, uh, take action where needed, and then go back and even uh, look, look uh, at history and understand what could have been done differently or better. Uh, we have uh, some good engagements with folks like MCRD, so the recruiting depot in San Diego. We are uh, on base today. Uh, we have a number of other bases who are interested in things like uh, security around the perimeter, so we have uh, uh, some things like our drone solutions or some of our uh, license plate readers on fleet uh, vehicles that are being put uh, into uh, to use today. And we have right now a tremendous interest in modernizing the Taser to the Taser 10 uh, that I had mentioned earlier. So we are currently on base with a number of our older devices uh, and looking to really modernize and uh, get the, the latest and greatest into the hands of those, uh, those folks on base, absolutely. The company is touting the Taser 10, which has 10 prongs that can be fired one at a time allowing for more chances to get a prong on target. That and features such as an alarm might help de-escalate a tense and dangerous situation. And I couldn't leave without giving it a go myself. This is gonna be your safety, your selector switch. So okay. just push that up. Good, now it's, it's armed. You can see there's three, three rounds. Now, remember I was showing this as a show of force. I want yeah. you to take your, this thumb and push up and you're gonna push it up, and you're gonna point at that guy, and you're just telling him, hey, get Where? on the ground, you're under arrest. Okay. You're giving him all these verbal commands. This is an opportunity for him to give up. Yeah. But he's not. Okay. So now I want you to punch it out, extend your arm straight out. Good, now go for his legs. Go down to his legs. Good, that's a good hit. That it tells me it's a good hit, it's gonna go. But let's say it was a bad hit. You have upwards of you know, eight more shots. I gave you one more. So just anywhere in the body, go ahead and pull that trigger one more time. Good, there's a third shot. So you'd have seven more if you needed to. Now, I would, if I'm your partner, I'm gonna be moving in. I'm gonna be handcuffing. It's called cuffing under power. I'm gonna put the cuffs on them. I'm gonna search them and all that stuff. So you can go ahead now, make it safe by just pushing this down and then pull it into you, just pull it back in the closer. You take the palm of your hand, put it right here and see if you can vigorously pull it out. Oh, man. There you go. Nice. <laughs> you're going to holster this device. I'll be your holster. You're going to holster it. Now, all you're going to do is take these wires and rip them. Just take them and rip them. That's it. And then you would just... Wow, those are thin. Yep. And then you would just go ahead and reinsert the magazine, and you have seven more rounds okay. to go. And in other military news, the Pentagon announced Tuesday that a U.S. service member is in North Korean custody after fleeing across the border from South Korea. U.S. officials said he was facing disciplinary actions after being held on assault charges this month. Here's more on that developing story.
So we woke up today to news that a U.S. soldier had been detained in North Korea. And that was pretty striking in itself. But as details started to emerge, it turned out that this soldier had been arrested in South Korea, had been in jail, and was being transferred out of the country to be returned to Fort Bliss to face uh, military disciplinary action. When somehow he departed the airport, he didn't get on a plane back to the U.S., and ended up on a tour at the demilitarized zone, which is the uh, border between North Korea and South Korea. And the soldier then crossed into North Korea. And what has happened after that, we simply don't know. Suddenly I noticed a guy running, a guy dressed in black, running for what looked like full gas towards the North Korean side. US and South Korean soldiers sort of realized what was happening, chased after him, they didn't catch him. So far, there are very few details on the US soldier who was detained except that he's uh, been identified as a uh, private second class Travis King. We are still looking for details on his hometown, on what additional charges he may face. He may be simply trying to avoid charges and now that he's in North Korea has probably made his situation a lot worse. The Pentagon isn't saying much, saying that they need to talk to his family first. Uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at a press conference today just expressed his concern for the well-being of this individual service member and said that more will likely come in the days ahead. I'm absolutely foremost concerned about the welfare of our troop. And so we will remain focused on this. And again, uh, this this will develop in the next uh, uh, several days and hours and uh, we'll keep you posted. Coming up next, our personal finance expert gives you tips on how to avoid missing a credit card payment. Stay tuned. Welcome back. On this edition of Money Minute, Navy Federal Credit Union personal finance expert Jeanette Mack offers tips on how to maintain good credit by always making your payment on time. Life is hectic. There's no two ways about it. Keeping up with a busy schedule is hard to do, and it can make missing a credit card payment easy to happen. But you know what's just as easy? Setting up auto payments. If you haven't used this service yet, once you do, you'll wonder what took you so long. It is the sure way to get your payments in on time, every time. If you don't want to set it and forget it, set it and set up notifications so you'll be reminded that the payment will be made two to three days before it comes out of your account. Now you can take that vacation without having to worry about paying your credit card bill. Take it a step further with a pro move. Set up a checking account dedicated solely to your bills and recurring payments. Keeping your bill money separate can help with budgeting. The money in your other checking account is money you can use to save or for other spending. Making on-time payments monthly is crucial in developing or maintaining a good credit score, which in the long run helps keep more of your money in your pocket where it belongs. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more coverage of military and defense topics, fill that thermos with coffee without spilling it, and check out Army, Navy, Air Force, and MarineCorpsTimes.com, as well as DefenseNews.com. And to be the sharpest guardian patrolling the stars, sign up for our Early Bird Brief newsletter, compiled each morning to bring you the latest headlines. It's also an audio. Check out the podcast version out each weekday wherever you get your podcasts. And if social media is where you get your news, follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. When we return, the strategy for maintaining peace in the Indo-Pacific and how the U.S. is evolving its posture for strength in the region. Welcome back. Maintaining peace in the Pacific is a top priority for the United States Indo-Pacific Command, as it is not only protecting allies and partners in the region, but also ensuring the Indo-Pacific region remains free and open to support global trade. In a recent webcast, Defense News examined the strategic importance of the Indo-Pacific to the United States, how the military is working with diplomats and other nations to maintain peace and commerce in the region. With us today is Dr. Stephen Wills, a Navalist for the Center for Maritime Strategy at the Navy League of the United States. 
Dr. Wills was an active duty U.S. Navy officer for 20 years and is an expert in U.S. Navy strategy and policy and U.S. Navy surface warfare programs and platforms. We're excited to have him with us today for this discussion. Let's jump right in. You know, obviously the size of the force is one topic of discussion as we look at being best prepared for a fight in the Pacific. There's also, you know, emerging capabilities, uh, not necessarily to offset the size of the fleet, but just sort of to provide a different type of advantage. Um, and I wonder, you know, as you look at the threat evolving in the Pacific, what is the U.S. Navy doing to sort of best match its capabilities to what's happening in the Pacific? And are there any areas where you think maybe the Navy is not pursuing a new technology aggressively enough to keep up? That, that's a good point. Uh, let's start out first at the high end. Let's start with carrier aviation, certainly. Um, we've seen now the development of the MQ-25A, the unmanned tanker aircraft, which has, I think, great potential to extend uh, the range and capability of the manned air wing, F-18EFs and, uh, and now F-35Cs. This is a significant development. It would be nice, though, if we kept pursuing it so that you have an unmanned strike aircraft as well. Uh, that was one of the early goals. Understand it's difficult uh, from the perspective of, of naval aviation to integrate manned platforms and unmanned platforms and sort of that high speed naval aviation environment. But that's one place we could keep moving forward. Uh, following that manned, unmanned teaming aspect. Uh, the Surface Navy has worked that as well too with the uh, large unmanned surface vehicle that we've seen demoed uh, most recently in, in the RIMPAC, last RIMPAC exercise. This is another good way forward. How do we wanna use these though? That's still uh, a question. Is this another strike platform? Is this perhaps a missile magazine for defensive missiles. Uh, when I see this, I get the, the vision of a 1980s video game, Missile Command, where you could tap in and access that other missile base over on the far side of the screen. These unmanned platforms could potentially be missile magazines that you could empty and then hit return to base button on them, and they disappear off to go back and, and be reloaded someplace. Uh, so that's another place you can pursue unmanned. And if we dip below the waters into the subsurface environment, if you imagine every submarine having a number of unmanned teamed units with it uh, that could carry out both offensive and defensive missions, maybe lay mines. So if anything, the Navy should keep pushing ahead with this manned unmanned teaming concept uh, Naval Sea Systems Command's PEO, Unmanned Systems and Small Combatants, is working on a whole bunch of different platforms. You've probably seen more of them recently than I have, based on your travels and so forth. Uh, they're really impressive. So if you think about it as a manned, unmanned teaming thing, with the manned unit being augmented by uh, the unmanned units, and you imagine every ship uh, you imagine aviation units and submarines sort of traveling with maybe eventually a swarm of these uh, that augment its capabilities. We seem to be traveling in that direction, and that's a worthwhile one to continue traveling in uh, because it makes the most of both sides of this, the man part for command and control, weapons release, decision making, and the unmanned part that gives you mass uh, maneuver and the ability to do more things and take more casualties. It's better to lose the unmanned systems. Uh, they are expensive. They're not easily replaceable, but it's better to lose those than to lose the manned ones. Certainly. Every now and again, we sort of hear some criticisms uh, when you know, clearly China is the, the pacing threat and the Pacific is the focus region. Um, but every now and again, we hear criticisms that perhaps the Navy or Marine Corps is becoming a one trick pony, you know, only focused on one fight. Um, all the unmanned technologies you've listed off that the Navy should be pursuing sound like they would be applicable anywhere in the world. Is that, you know, something that sort of helps bolster that argument to continue down this line of technology development? I think it does. And, and the baseline capability of, of unmanned systems is surveillance, uh, reconnaissance, uh, et cetera. So uh, what you saw pioneered in Task Force 59 in the Fifth Fleet region in the Persian Gulf uh, is certainly very, is a useful experiment in terms of using the unmanned units to develop a more accurate picture uh, of the region. Uh, again, letting the commander conserve his or her manned units 
for more important missions and allowing you know these unmanned units to cover the depth needed or the mass needed uh, to look at, at a wide area. And certainly using unmanned systems for that purpose, for reconnaissance, scouting, uh, they're absolutely good for that. And that's good for any part of the world. That then enables you to reserve your manned units for those more important things, like an important port visit that has you know political implications, that idea of naval diplomacy, uh, something that people have been doing with warships ever since the Egyptian pharaoh Hatshepsut sent some of her warships to visit Punt in Somalia, some, you know, 3,500 years ago. Uh, you know, this is an ongoing thing. People used warships as ambassadors of goodwill, and you can't do that with an unmanned ship. So again, getting this balance right uh, in terms of what manned units can do for you or crewed units can do for you versus uncrewed units is all important. And that's all we have time for this week. Please visit us on militarytimes.com and defensenews.com for more coverage. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.